No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. All right, so uh, I think this was Blake's idea. No, I believe it was Eve's. It was Eve's. Yeah. You're oh, nice. you're be shitting me. I I'm not be shitting. <laughs> she could tell you all about that word yes, and more because that's what she does. Oh, thank you. She's a medievalist. Thank you. Um, so I'll let her talk all about what thank we're you. doing here now, a little bit later. All right, one more time. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Ghosts and Vampires Classifying the Undead panel. Uh, hi, I'm Eve. I'm a medieval medievalist. Um, I've been a med medievalist now for... Um, I'm going to let everyone on the panel uh, introduce themselves briefly. I'm Joe Nickel. I'm Senior Research Fellow for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, publishers of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine and um, author of uh, umpteen books, uh, including Entities, and uh, more recently, Tracking the Man Beasts, which, uh, if you've seen it, has me as a zombie in the book, for, for example. So I'm going to take the position of defending the undead. <laughs> a much, much maligned group. And if you believe that, you're not as skeptical as we would like at Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Hi, I'm Blake Smith. I'm the host of the Monster Talk podcast. Uh, thank you. Which is uh, the science show about monsters. And uh, in addition to studying monsters and researching ghosts and the paranormal, I also watch a lot of fictional uh, things like and read. Uh, I've watched a lot of monster movies, so, which is the basis for most of my knowledge. <laughs> And Blake does a lot of monstrous puns as well. So. I do. Terrible. Um, I'm, I'm Ben Radford. I'm um, the deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine and author of uh, six books, most recently Tracking the Chupacabra, uh, which is about a, a vampiric... Uh, I heard a clap. Thank you. Uh, which is about a... <laughs> thanks, ma thanks, Mom. Um, which is about a, a vampiric uh, creature as well. So uh, I've done uh, numerous investigations into monsters, uh, both... Uh, with, with Joe Nickel over there and myself and some with Blake. And so, um, yeah, this is a topic that I find fascinating and interesting, and uh, hopefully we'll get, uh, get some good uh, commentary. Um, now, as I said, I'm a medievalist, so my interest in, in uh, the undead uh, is sort of historical um, and literary. Um, my dissertation was on uh, body and soul poems, which is angry, damned souls return to yell at their bodies uh, for be behaving badly. Sometimes the bodies talk back, and sometimes there are good souls too, but they're terribly, terribly dull, so they don't usually work. And so that's sort of like a ghost, um, except it's really meant to be purely didactic. But I'm also interested in, there are, Old Norse literature is just full of uh, the undead. Um, and I'm interested in those. Uh, so. I'm interested in, in ghosts and vampires from sort of a historic point of view. And one thing I've noticed um, is that ghost believers often argue that ghosts must be real um, because there are ghost stories from virtually every culture and every time period on the planet. And I understand this point of view to an extent. Um, but I've always found that hi the history of ghost stories actually argues against uh, the reality of ghosts because um, the ghosts tend to fit the culture from which they come. Um, ghosts and ghost stories and revenants and zombies and vampires change radically over time and from culture to culture. So to begin with, what is a ghost? Um, if you ask the guys from Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, Ghost Lab, Ghost Wranglers, Ghost Snatchers, World Deadliest Ghost Catches, <laughs> Martha Stewart's Unliving, oh. Queer Eye for the Dead Guy. <laughs> I, no, no, I'll waste it. Oh my God, I can't believe you were caught dead in that. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, they'd probably say something about energy. Um, and this isn't entirely surprising because 
the culture um, modern ghost stories come from sort of combines uh, New Age with uh, schmience, which is like science, but not really. Um, now, Wikipedia offers a more traditional definition, quote, the soul or spirit of a deceased person or animal that can appear in visible form or other manifestation to the living, unquote. And probably most people would agree that ghosts are generally insubstantial. However, um, there's already problems with this description. Often ghosts are invisible, but sometimes they can be seen, sometimes only as shadows, but sometimes as full body apparitions. Um, sometimes they're solid, sometimes they're transparent. Um, they can be heard speaking, whispering, laughing, breathing with non-existent lungs, speaking with non-existent vocal cords, um, although some of them can only have their voices imprinted on recording devices, um, usually of a staticky nature. Uh, sometimes ghosts can interact with physical objects, they touch, brush against, attack people, um, they make knocking sounds, they throw things, they play with equipment, they <laughs> love to drown, er, drain batteries apparently. Um, they can disappear and walk through walls but they generally don't sink through floors unless they do it dramatically like at a gravesite or something. Um, so do they have mass or not? Or do they uh, have, are they bound by gravity or not? And as far as I can tell, ghosts are bound by the laws of physics, kind of, sort of, except when they aren't. Um, and that's modern ghosts. Um, what are we to make of this ghost described by William of Newburgh in the 12th century? Uh, a sinful man had died. Um, after his death, he began appearing in the town accompanied by the sound of howling dogs. Because what's an undead without some howling dogs? Um, quote, the doors of every house were bolted and nobody dared go uh, out to attend to any business from sunset to sunrise for fear of being attacked. But even such a precaution was useless since by the circulation of air uh, infected by the corpse, the neighborhood became filled with the sick and dying, unquote. Two brothers whose, fathers of whose father had died of the pestilence dug up the body, which was, quote, grotesque and distended with a swollen reddened face, unquote. When they struck the body, uh, there was a bunch of blood that flowed from it, and they realized it was a sanguisuga, um, a bloodsucker or leech. Um, and they removed the heart and burnt the corpse, after which the pestilence subsided. Did they do it at crossroads? Not in this case, no. Um, William tells uh, several different tales. This is the only one that actually involves blood. Um, and you may be thinking, well, that's silly. That's not a ghost. That's a vampire or something. Um, but how do we decide on the taxa taxonomy of the undead? How do we decide who's a ghost, who's a vampire, who's a zombie, who's a revenant? Most of our ideas of these classifications are for fairly modern and to some extent derived from literature and film. In early time periods, it's a lot more difficult uh, to tell who's what among the undead. Um, also in the 12th century, William of Malmesbury and Walter Mapp uh, talk about walking, the walking dead, and they often are corporeal. As I mentioned before, Old Norse sagas are positively, positively crawling with uh, the undead. And although they're in Norse, there are several words for such creatures. In English, it's almost, they're usually uh, translated as ghost, even though they are almost invariably uh, corporeal. Um, a writer known as the Monk of Byland lived in the same area as William of Newburgh, which is northern England, but about 200 years later than William. And he tells a number of tales that resemble Williams in some way. There are, again, corporeal ghosts, though some of them shapeshift. Um, generally, though, they're less violent and come to less sticky ends than Williams' ghosts. Um, most of them want to right a wrong or receive absolution. And the difference seems to be that by the time the monk of Byland was writing, um, which is the end of the 14th century, the doctrine of purgatory uh, was widely known and accepted. And this helped, to, as I said, helps to explain the differences between William of Newburgh and the monk of Byland. Um, indeed, the development of purgatory was a great 
boomed the medieval ghost story. Um, because for a long time, the sort of semi-official position of the church was that the damned couldn't come back, the saved wouldn't come back. Um, that didn't stop people from telling ghost stories, but uh, even churchmen. But it, the church was uncomfortable with it, and the suggestion was it was actually you know demons. If you saw a dead person, it was really a demon. Um, but with purgatory added to the afterlife real estate list listings, um, a retur return from the dead seemed more po uh, possible and more acceptable. Um, According to Jacques Le Goff, in The Birth of Purgatory, Purgatory actually was to some extent popularized by ghost stories. So the ghost stories were a sort of propaganda for purgatory. And not just for pur purgatory. Um, because imperfect dead souls could be saved now, but only after they'd been tortured for a while. Yes, that's what purgatory is. Um, so naturally, they looked for ways to shorten their sentences. Uh, and so they kind of needed the help of, of living people, which meant they came back. Um, they might want to warn a loved one or announce an imminent death, or they might want to right a wrong, return ill-gotten gains. But increasingly, they asked for or demanded uh, that relatives pay masses or prayers for their souls. Um, coincidentally, you'll just be shocked to learn this, many of these ghost stories came out of monasteries which by this time were essentially uh, factories for the production of masses and prayers for the dead. So ghost stories were actually propaganda for the monasteries as well, um, as well as for purgatory. So this um, is like indulgences? Exactly. Okay. Um, the <clears throat> pray for the dead, they get time off from purgatory. And often, you know, the dead would come back at the end and say, oh, thanks, um, and go on. <laughs> that's, that's good. So, so, so after someone's been prayed out of purgatory, mm -hmm. uh, except for perhaps saying thanks, we wouldn't see their ghost again? Right, because okay. then they, they go to heaven. And, yay. Okay. Um, and, and you do really you get some really strange things because there was competition between the monasteries <laughs> for, uh, uh, um, you know, well, money. Um, and uh, early on, the Cistercians and Cluniacs were big on uh, uh, afterlife insurance. Uh, so, <laughs> but then they had a real run for their money by, with the, from the Dominicans and uh, Franciscans. And there is a ghost story, the moral of which basically is Cistercians are better than Dominicans. Um, there's a Dominican nun wandering about. Um, and she's been failed by her own family, who are also Dominican nuns, and her her sisters in in uh, the the nunnery, uh, uh, because they haven't prayed her out of purgatory. So uh, a C Cistercian abbot hears about this, and he prays her out of purgatory because Cistercians are better than uh, I, Dominicans. I find it interesting that that this. Uh You've got the nomenclature issue mm -hmm. going on in the Middle Ages, and it's still going on today. I mean, yeah. you get phenomena. If you, if I think most skeptics look at it theoretically from the phenomena side, what's the phenomena that's being reported, and then try to figure out what's happening. But uh, I know that there's also um, a, a huge uh, number of words that describe particular things, like a, a poltergeist describes right. a particular thing, or a specter or an EVP. Uh, so uh, I find it kind of disheartening just to this discussion about nomenclature has been going on, going on for so long. Uh, anyway. But there is a, a one ghost story, from a, a work called The Antidote to Atheism. So I'm afraid to mention it because it might just convert all of you. But it just, it, it's like, it's, uh, it's like what? a... <laughs> a non -atheist. To, to theist. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> um, he, it's, like a vampire sometimes, like a ghost, a poltergeist, it just, it's everything you could want in an undead person. Um, <laughs> it's the ultimate undead. Um, but anyway, the, the difficulty in, in deciding what an undead is, you can see in uh, the play Hamlet by Shakespeare. Um, ah, that one. That's a good one. Yeah. That's my favorite Hamlet. Yeah. <laughs> Where the, the ghost of Hamlet's father is called a spirit. 
um, an apparition, but he's also referred to as a corpse and is said to come out of his grave. So he, he's corporeal and he's spirit. Um, he also seems to be coming from purgatory, despite the fact that he's a product of Protestant England. Um, and like uh, pagan uh, Lutheran Denmark. Um, so weird combinations of things. But at any uh, rate, one thing we don't see modern ghosts doing really is asking for uh, indulgences anymore or prayers uh, to get them out of purgatory. Um, so that, uh, again, isn't one way in which ghosts have changed. However, one thing about medieval ghosts, whether they were incorpor incorporeal or not, whether they wanted to warn their loved ones or kill them, um, they were unambiguous. People saw them. They knew what, exactly where they were. Uh, there was no people just going around going, what was that? Um, <laughs> when the only way of recording ghosts was with a, a quill and parchment, um, the, they were perfectly clear. Um, now that plumbers have a dizzying array of uh, equipment um, to record the ghosts, uh, there are, they seem to be a bit fuzzier, um, which I, I find odd. Uh, so that's my thing about uh, it's always been a problem sort of classifying the undead. Um, ben, I believe, modern undead. Yeah, I mean, I one thing I find interesting, I mean, I come across this a lot, whether it's talking about ghosts or Bigfoot over out, someone says, oh, well, you know, as we all know, there are five types of ghosts. I'm like, really? We, we all know this? You read this where? Uh, or even even within Bigfoot. I mean, there's uh, there's variations of Bigfoot. There's skunk apes and yaoi's and you know, where you are in regional variations. And so, uh, part of the problem is that you know when you when you talk to some of these these experts on on, on ghosts and, and cryptozoological things as well and, and writers is that they 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 get so involved in in going down the wrong path. Like, well, you know, let's, you know, these are the different types of ghosts. There's residual ghosts and there's ghosts that are lurking because their deaths were unavenged and this and that. And, and they're so busy categorizing these things that they're not looking at the, they're not examining the assumptions and the premises. You know, like, well, first let's make sure these things exist, and then once we've established that, then we can go on and figure out how these things, you know, w would be categorized in some ta uh, taxonomic, you know, uh, schema. Um, so in, in a way, and the subject to me is almost like asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Uh, I mean, you can categorize ghosts however you want to. Uh, I think that the, the the most useful one is is through a folkloric point of view. Um, you know, you can look at uh, we were talking about ghosts earlier. You can look at vampires in in the same way that the ghosts uh, have a long existence all around the world. Uh, vampires are also known globally, dating back to the ancient Greeks. In fact, um, virtually every culture in the world has some variation of some entity, uh, either either demonic. Uh, or there was something that was never human, or a revenant, which is basically uh, something that was human and became a vampire. But some variation of that that either that drained a bodily substance, either energy or blood or fat or something else like that, from the people. So again, as she was talking about earlier, just because all different people around the world have some regional variation of this doesn't necessarily mean that they're talking about the same thing. In fact, the, the very fact that, that many of these things are culturally bound uh, really strongly suggests that that that, that there isn't uh, that there isn't w one phenomenon that everybody's describing. So, um, and it was interesting, one other thing when you were talking about uh, the purgatory, mm -hmm. it's curious because there there are elements of that that still exist today. For example, uh, I've talked to a lot of ghost investigators, and particularly psychics, uh, who believe that they are that they are helping ghosts to move to the other world. So there, there is this there is this notion that that if there's a, a spirit in a house or a haunted location, the reason they're there is because they need human help, particularly this particular psychic self, to sort of like look towards the light, no the other light, yeah. no go, it's good, you know. And they, they go through this whole like you know very emotional thing, and I'm helping. And I've talked to people, and it's fascinating. I, I watch someone like over the course of 10 or 15 minutes, who I believe they I believe they sincerely and genuinely believe that they just helped. A, a poor, helpless spirit into the next world. And they're like, hey, this is awesome. I, I did a good job for the day. You know, let's go get a beer. I'm like, 
the, all this happened in your head. So it's, yeah, so I think it's interesting because again, part of that whole notion of of a transition uh, still uh, still is retained in some of the modern ghost investigations and, and hunters. Yeah. So uh, the uh, woman who's famously known as the ghost whisperer. Uh, for example, as Catholic upbringing, and she she sees her role as bringing uh, spirits to the light and helping them cross over. So she's not connecting with people, you know, in in the other world, but sort of this world who are trapped. And mm -hmm. she helps guide them to the light. And I've I've studied uh, her background and her approach, and I'm convinced that she is uh, clearly what's called a fantasy-prone personality. That is a, a perfectly sane and normal person, but they're sort of over at one end of the imaginary, imagination uh, spectrum. And they uh, vividly uh, see entities and, uh, and imagine things and have, uh, as children, maybe imaginary playmates. They grow up to have, uh, you know, a contact with the Virgin Mary or or ghosts or something, and they're a special, they're a special breed. Um, I might comment too on um, a couple of things that have come up. One is the idea that that there are many different kinds of, of ghosts and kinds of uh, other uh, supernatural entities. And I think some of that comes about because people are uh, describing contradictory things. And so if sometimes a ghost does this and sometimes a ghost does that, well, maybe uh, instead of saying that's a contradiction and that really just shows that it's all folklore, no, it, it shows there are two kinds of ghosts, you see. And uh, uh, one more point, when we talk about ghosts being seen around the world and every culture having them, there are some recognizable mental states that occur in humankind. One of those, uh, let me ask, how many of you know of a mental state called a waking dream? Okay, this is unusual uh, to see this many hands go up because obviously you're skeptics. <laughs> Am I correct? Yes. Uh, but but you wake up at night, you see uh, you you uh, see a strange entity by your bedside, and uh, it might be a ghost or a vampire. And this is because you're in the state between being fully awake and fully asleep, and you're in a, you're actually hallucinating, and that's common. We can track that back in the Middle Ages to incubuses and succubuses. Today, uh, alien abductees are saying how they woke up and they saw aliens beside their bed. So we're tracking a similar phenomenon, but it's changing uh, culturally and psychologically. Uh, Out-of-body experiences are another type of mental state that can give rise to ghosts, a belief in ghosts, the idea that your, your spirit uh, lifts up out of your body and you can see your body. So this idea that body and spirit can separate and the ghost could leave the body. But in fact, uh, we know that when your brain is dead, brain function ceases. So it's not very likely that you could walk, talk, and say boo. But uh, we're hopeful. Uh, anyway, uh, there, are, there are a number of those states. Those are just a couple. But that, that could cause people around the world to have experiences, near-death experiences, for example. Um, certain cultural differences in how they're described, but that people have them, hallucinations of the oxygen-starved brain or, or other types of hallucination, could give rise to, to belief in ghosts. And um, those, those are not proof that ghosts therefore exist, just proof that our brains are similar across cultures. And, and across every culture, ghosts tend to be an explanation for something that's happened. So, uh, is it Dr. Baker is saying? Is it, you want to say that? About sort of no haunted, I don't want to spoil oh, it. Uh, yeah, uh, you do uh, it. It's a <laughs> my, uh, my late friend, the psychologist Robert Baker, uh, he and I used to be called the original Ghostbusters uh, because we, we traveled and, and uh, went into so many haunted places. But he had, he had a, a, a very wise saying, there are no haunted places only haunted people and it was very very wise it is it really is i mean you you it's like the tree falling in the forest you, you won't find ghosts without people observing and i think the common factor there is people we want to see explanations for bizarre things and what happens is a person who's experienced something that i would at the time i, I classified as a haunting uh you once you're on that track aha 
look, these light bulbs are exploding. These doors are closing by themselves. You start to sort of compile every strange phenomena into your haunting rather than looking at each individual phenomena and trying to find out why it's happening. So um, the ghost is an explanation, is, is a nice shortcut, and it's an exciting shortcut. It's a scary, spooky shortcut. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't really give you true resolution to what's really, going on. Really, really true. Uh, the, the very first uh, haunting I investigated at McKinsey House in Toronto is a good example of that. You had uh, caretakers, different sets of caretakers living in the house. They, they had a number of experiences. For example, one caretaker's wife woke up and saw a little man in a frock coat standing beside her bed. Well, that's a classic waking dream. Um, kind of end of explanation there. Uh, they would, uh, lying in bed at night, hear over there across the house, they would hear uh, heavy thudding footsteps on the stairs when there was no one in the house and the house was locked. When I went there and investigated, I found that they were in fact hearing footsteps on the stairs, but they were coming from the building next door, which was about 40 inches uh, further away and had a parallel iron staircase and the late night cleanup crew and uh, others were, were on the stairs. So, but because there was a ghost, you see, as soon as they heard footsteps, then rather than look for a source of that or an explanation for that, they were just adding that to the, to the ghost legend. And then when some um, psychics and warlocks were in the house and took a picture of a piano and one of the guys was sort of gesturing like this and you see this mist around the picture, well, that was said to be, you know, um, the mist was another ghost. But all it was was the the flash of the camera and you can see the strong lights and shadows and glare in the picture you can determine that it was a flash picture and you can see that the flash simply bounced off the white pages of music and washed out an area of the photograph so um, you if, if you would look at the different things that were happening you could actually explain them in mundane terms physical terms but if you had this governing idea of a ghost nearly anything that would happen in the house would be added by process of accretion to the ghost legend. Uh, along with the idea that ghosts are an explanation for something, the vampires, uh, with a lot of the folklore stories, they're clearly they're an explanation for sickness and death. Um, because an awful lot of vampire stories, uh, you know, not Dracula-like ones, um, but in Revenant stories, uh, there's a sickness going around and that you just sort of blame death on the dead. The first person who dies, usually the vampire. Um, and, and often, again, with the vampire stories, they, there are stories of someone saying, someone who had previously died came to that person at night, sat on their chest, and you know, smothered them or something. So again, that's very much like a sleep, seems to be sleep it's paralysis. It's a waking dream with sleep paralysis. Sometimes you, you uh, uh, the waking dream is accompanied by sleep paralysis because the body is is still in the sleep mode you guys, so you wake up and you're you're unable to move and you hallucinate that that's because a demon is sitting on your chest or aliens have you strapped down aboard a spaceship or what have you have you has anybody here had that sleep paralysis yeah I, i've had it too it's very scary, scary i understand yeah it's very scary so it really feels like somebody's on top of you it's quite but, creepy yeah but that's that's true i think about the the vampires and and uh some kind of uh, epidemic because I uh, was interested in American vampire lore and there are a number of interesting cases for example in Vermont so I went there and I visited the actual graves of these uh, vampires uh, talked to local historians dug up records and so forth had a, had a very interesting time doing it and invariably these had to do with uh, um, tuberculosis consumption of the day. Someone was, was dying of consumption and then someone else would be stricken with, with this contagious experience. They would have a pale, a pale look. They would be coughing up blood. Uh, so a number of the, the characteristics of consumption could be, could be shown in the descriptions and th this idea of contagion was was um, being laid on to the vampire, but it was it was a real contagion. So it, again, it was um, in this case th these were these were real cases of something happening, but they weren't understood medically very well. So they were 
explained folkloristically. They were explained as with the myth of the, the vampire. Yeah, they didn't understand illness, and they also didn't understand uh, what bodies were supposed to look like after. They didn't understand the process of decay. So if they dug up a body and it you know, wasn't basically a mummy or a skeleton, they went, ah, vampire. Um, and, and the descriptions of the vampires, they'll always say complete and undecayed but then describe them in more detail and it becomes very clear that in fact they are in the uh, process of uh, a putrefaction, which is they're, they're bloated, or they, they, they come, they've Three gained nails. weight yeah, in the grave. Right, they gain weight. Yeah. Sometimes they give birth. Yeah. Blood um, trickling out the mouth, yeah. swollen abdomen, right. nails pulled back. Right. Um, yeah. Which is actually interesting because it's important to, to realize that the, the characteristics of, of an alleged uh, vampire case are much more specific than the characteristics of a ghost. Uh, and we've been talking about what would lead people to believe that there's a vampire in their presence. In the case of a ghost, hell, if you lose your keys, if you can't find your keys, mm -hmm. it could be a ghost. Yeah. If you take photos and there's a white spot, it could be a ghost. If you walk into an area and you get a weird feeling, it could be a ghost. I mean, basically... You know, a cold spot. I mean, take care of the, 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 the number of phenomena that are supposed to be associated with ghosts is, is far more broad, which I think is, is one of the reasons why it's, it's such, a, such a worldwide phenomenon. It's just, it's so, you know, if, you, if you're warm, it could be a ghost. If you're cold, it could be a ghost. I mean, <laughs> take, take your pick. And I think this goes back to the whole notion that, and I've talked to, when I've talked to, done investigations, I've talked to, to ghost hunters, and it, they, they seem to think that ghost is an explanation. I'm like, Saying something is a ghost, that doesn't explain anything. <laughs> that doesn't get us any closer to what it is. I mean, okay, it's a ghost. And what is that? Uh, well, we don't really know. Okay, well, then you're just substituting a question mark with a question mark. Uh, and, you know, certainly when you're trying to categorize ghosts, I mean, the way I think about it is that, is, you know, the categories of things that we know for a fact exist in the real world, such as animals, okay? You can categorize animals in, in all sorts of different ways. Some of them are arbitrary. You can categorize um, ungulates by the number of toes. We can categorize, you know, there's all sorts of different ways you could categorize the, the world around us, trees by their height, the number of branches, the leaf, whatever else. But there's also the exceptions. I mean, not everything that, that swims in the, in, the, in the ocean is a fish. You've got cetaceans, such as, uh, you know, whales and, and, uh, and porpoises, which, which are mammals. They, they, they breathe air, but they're in the ocean. So you have these sorts, so you can categorize it wherever you want. And the problem is when you're looking at something like a ghost, you're, you're talking about something that nobody can, can it's like nailing jello to a wall I mean you can you can pick any number of definitions and whatever definitions you want to use you can use that within a particular within a particular framework it's like when I used to play Dungeons and Dragons D&D &D players here oh yeah see, this is it's Dragon, Dragon Con, Con. The Dragon Con right Duh. I mean all right I, 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 here's, I haven't played D&D &D in years so I haven't seen the, the latest fourth edition how many dragons are in the latest monster manual I don't know how many are there a dozen 20 Last last time I checked in the Monster Manual, there's like six. Just dragons. Well, there's the chromatic dragons. Yeah, I mean, when I was playing D and D, I mean, Gygax, you know, there were red dragons, blue dragons, silver dragons, and each of them had their own different characteristics. You know, some of them were cranky, some of them guarded treasure. You have chromatic and metallic, and chromatic are evil, metallic are good, and then you have nerd alert, nerd alert. Hey, who here? LARPs Vampire the Masquerade. Anybody? I just said the point never... here, thank you, Blake. The point here is that these these arbitrary categorizations of these of these dragons, they work fine within a particular context. Within a particular within the D D world, everybody agrees on this. These are the characteristics. We can we can categorize these. Outside of that, it's it, it, those categorizations are meaningless. And that's that's part of the problem with, with ghosts, is it outside of one particular investigator's viewpoint or description of a ghost. It's, it's a free-for-all. Which goes back to what I was saying. You, you really want to look at the phenomena that, that's at the basis of it uh, rather than just the name, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of Poltergeist, which, I mean, that's self-explanatory, right? So that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting, uh, we're getting a little uh, afield with dragons. We've, yeah. we've got enough to do with uh, ghosts and vampires. Dragons are real. But, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> dragons. There are undead. <laughs> the scab track drag. One more well, evidence I, I think, in years. I think what Joe is trying to say is we should be talking about Draco liches. Um, oh, there we so, go. Anyway. Well, I'm, uh, I'm I'm trying to get back to uh, to vampires. Uh, rather desperately trying to to get back to vampires. 
But if there's a popular movement to change the topic to dragons, <laughs> uh, I can I can uh, deal with that. It is Dragon I, Con. So. I'm uh, draconian with the uh, with the best of it. Nice. Well, Ooh, the. Yeah. Um, the um, and you thought your puns were bad. It's at a different scale. Right, go ahead. <laughs> the uh, the current embodiment of the of the uh, of the vampire is probably the chupacabra, which uh, showed up in 1995 as as uh, a phenomenon in Puerto Rico. And I, at the time, tracked that. Uh, you could track it in the Spanish media. It went it went to other areas, Mexico. I had uh, Mexican friends tracking uh, the um, the legend of the chupacabra. There came to to southern United States again in the Spanish speaking media, and was was said to be vampiric only because the um, the carcasses of animals were being found drained of blood. Now that actually was was morphing. Here's this Puerto Rican phenomenon, but we had the remember the cattle mutilation phenomenon in America. That was the same. It's really the same phenomenon. You have you have animals that are being killed by something, and they're being drained of blood. Hence the idea, just that one notion that that connects it to the vampire. And it turned out, uh, as we monitored those, the the uh, none of these animals were in fact drained of blood. People just thought they were. Uh, they the in fact the blood was simply settling by gravity in the carcass. But when necropsies were done on the carcasses. They were found. Not one of them was drained of blood. It's just a phenomenon that you know blood settles. It's the same thing that produces in a in a human corpse. If you watch your CSI shows, what's called avidity. It's the same same phenomenon. So all of that had again had a simple explanation, but it was here were these popular superstitions kind of picking up uh, genres and and explanations and and putting them together and creating. This new phenomenon of the the chupacabra, which is still still around. Ben, have you ever heard of the uh, chupacabra, Ben? Uh, <laughs> I, I I spent co- I spent about five years on it. I, I heard something about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, what's interesting to me is that is that you know within the context of the discussion of vampires is that is that you know as I as I trace back in the book, I mean the the. The, the chupacabra is a uniquely, um, uniquely Hispanic and Puerto Rican vampire. It, it comes, it, it draws from broader tradition, including uh, European vampires, as we talked about before, um, and I also talked about you know Latin American vampires and African vampires and, and things like that. And in this particular case, it was, it was a confluence of, of I mean, there's anti-American sentiment and uh, misinformation and in some cases it was used uh, as a tactic for, for uh, controlling people, for political gain, conspiracy theories. It was actually heavily promoted by UFO buffs, which is why to this day there's a very strong element of conspiracy theory and UFO connections to, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the, the chupacabra. In addition, by the way, to uh, creationism. Uh, and some of you may know, uh, one of the chupacabras that was found in uh, 2007 in Blanco, Texas, ended up in a creationist museum uh, run by a guy named John Adolfi. And it was, it was chosen to disprove evolution. Because, of course, uh, scientists said that, that chupacabras can't exist, and yet here it is. Well, DNA says it's a coyote, so I guess... Now, now, now notice, notice the irony here that DNA evidence, which is based on, upon evolution, disproved the, the creationist theory. So... Um, but yeah, that's is so. It's interesting, just again looking at looking at a, a very very modern version of the vampires because, you know, when when people think of, of vampires, they, they go back to Vlad Sepish, they go back to Bram Stoker, Anne Rice, uh, you know, Stephanie Meyer, and the, the the pop culture vampires. But here's a vampire that many people to this day, lots of people really sincerely believe exists. This is not this is not like Bigfoot to them. This is not like the Loch Ness monster to them. This is a real creature that they really think is is attacking livestock because they haven't read my book. Um, yeah. But but it's interesting to tie together these two ideas though. You've got uh, in the case of the cattle mutilations and in the case of the chupacabra with the the uh, goat killings. You you've in in the case of the vampires where people were rotting and people people really have no understanding in general of what of how bodies decay. There's a field of science called taphonomy, which, which actually researches and studies how people and other animals decay. And um, 
there's a body farm up in Tennessee where they study that for crime purposes. And it's, it's well understood in small circles, but in general, we kind of separate ourselves from death. And, and it's kind of it's disturbing to think we were walking around with dreams and hopes and goals and family and plans. And then we die, and poof, we're just a pile of rotten meat. It's really just it's kind of depressing. Um, and so it's kind of understandable that people ignore that the same way that we ignore you know, where our meat comes from in the grocery store. Are we tasting? We're delicious. That, that actually, in the upcoming episode of Monster Talk, we talk about cannibalism. It's quite, quite astonishing what people will do. Uh, uh, anyway, anyway, I'll let you. Well, with vampires, um, with uh, vampires again, uh, there, there are real traditions in some cases, and there, are, there are fake traditions. Uh, I, I did some research in New Orleans, and and in fact, at at uh, PsyCon, which will be in o late October, uh, I'm going to talk on this, but I'll give you a preview. There are some real folkloric traditions in New Orleans of ghosts, for example, genuine folklore. Um, there's genuine traditions there of uh, the loup garou, the the French werewolf, which you can track around and you know came to the Americas apparently hidden on board uh, French ships. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm being facetious, but, <laughs> but wherever the French oh. went, wherever the French went, the Loup Garou showed up and showed up in New Orleans. These are genuine folk traditions that have, have uh, existed in the New Orleans area. And yet uh, the, there's not any uh, tradition of, of vampires. It's all Anne Rice. They're just not, Anne Rice moved to New Orleans and vampires showed up uh, on the tours of the uh, you know the nightly ghost walk tours, some would say ghosts and vampires and so forth, and they were making this stuff up. Ghost uh, tour people were making up stories because the public wanted them. One tour guide that I hired for the day to take me to some specific shop, uh, specific uh, graveyards, give me an audience with a voodoo queen and so forth. She told me a story about uh, one person on on one of her tours. Uh, cemetery tours uh, wanted to know where such and such a grave was, vampire grave, and she tried to explain to her that that was fiction. It was just in Anne Rice's book, and the woman would not be. Wow. No, no, she said, no, no, that's that's real. That's that was based on that's real, and could not be dissuaded. So sometimes the fake lore can be more powerful than the folklore. Yeah, it's and to talk about New Orleans, we have to talk about zombies. There are another undead, right? So mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so we've and got. There are plenty of them uh, here this weekend. There's a lot of zombies here. Yeah. Zombies. And of course, of course, I mean, it seems like uh, by just sheer numbers that the Romero style zombie is the more popular one around here. So uh, I'm not sure. I guess it's because they're more dangerous. Uh, so you've got a, a traditional voodoo zombie is more like a, a slave. Yeah. That's uh, a lot like a slave. And from a culture uh, of Haiti where slavery was well known, it's not that surprising that this sort of uh, spiritual. Slavery developed as a kind of folklore, um, but the the Romero zombie is really based on the idea of the ghoul, uh, which is actually sort of an Arabic tradition of a of a shambling spirit that uh, devours human flesh. And so when George Romero made uh, Night of the Living Dead, it was originally going to be called Night of the Ghouls, um, and he never really calls them zombies in the film. But but the Romero version is taken off with and it's got a tremendous amount of popularity. I guess they're filming. Uh, the Walking Dead right now in Atlanta, and uh, I'm a big fan of zombies. But I do I, th I think it's very interesting the dichotomy between the traditional folkloric zombie and then the way the pop culture zombie has sort of just pushed that out and replaced it. Uh, I'm not sure why, but it's just well, I, I think it's because you know if, if if you have zombies who don't do nothing but slowly harvest sugar cane, Whoop, it's not that. terribly <laughs> interesting. Like, no, 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 please no, don't uh, don't harvest that sugar cane slowly. <laughs> no, please. That could be. Sold out. Yeah. Plus, to kill the uh, Haitian zombie, you, you need to, I believe, put salt in its mouth and rebury it. Uh, maybe with an incantation, maybe without. And that's a lot less cinematic than right. just uh, chopping them in the head and destroying the brain. Well, uh, I mean, that happens with vampires too. I mean, the the traditional, the real folkloric belief in vampires, they were they were peasants. Um, they, they, so not counts. They were, uh, they smelled bad wow, often. Yeah. Um, they were bloated. They were ruddy. They, they didn't were look not, like Brad Pitt. 
Not so much. Or, or, uh, a, or, 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 or possibly Bela. Brad Pitt after he'd been dead for quite a few weeks. Mm. So, I mean, they were unpleasant They were walking. unpleasant monsters. Right, right, Basically right, right. They were not sexy. Yeah, no. Right. Although, sometimes uh, they're... They were interested in the sex oh, okay. themselves, uh, but uh, not uh, the the women weren't throwing themselves at them. Right, yeah. right. So I guess that's a Stoker invention, I believe, that the sexy, seductive uh, yeah. vampire. Yeah, well, uh, him and there. Polidori. Oh, uh, up, 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 yep, yep. Interestingly enough, uh, and this is the subject of the my book, the Tracking the Man Beast. I, I'm fascinated by how much we tend to invent. Uh, entities that are in some ways in our image. Uh, think about it. Bigfoot is our stupid cousin from the past, a sort of throwback, uh, hairy uh, uh, man-ape creature who's almost the very symbol of the endangered species. And looked at another way, the extraterrestrial, the typical little big-eyed, big-headed humanoid, is a futuristic version of us who's come back in time to the planet Earth to help us deal with what we the terrible things we're doing to our planet. So these are versions of us. Uh, you can see uh, ghosts as transparent versions of us. Angels are us with wings. Um, vampires and werewolves are us with an attitude. And so, why are why are we inventing these things in in our image and and I think it's because we we are central to our to our own concerns and we we invent these these things in our image because that's what we are concerned about we're let me let me give you just one last idea that I think is important when when I talk about mythology most people think of the ancient Greeks and and Romans but we're watching right now in our own time, we, we are watching the burgeoning mythologies of Bigfoot and, and alien beings. And if, if we define mythology as supernormal beings interacting with humans in ways that are cosmically important, we have a, a rich uh, mythology developing right, right before our eyes. And that's worth studying. Um, I don't know. Perhaps we have a little bit of time left. We want to open uh, to Questions? Anyone have any? Not Bob. Unde yeah, not <laughs> Anyone with Bob. Sit down. <laughs> Undeady questions. There, there's a microphone in the middle there. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, characteristics of, of, of uh, good science is that you can make predictions. Um, and so many of the, the visions of the undead that we have seem to be coming from film and movies. Are people going to start sp seeing sparkly vampires? Is that like in the cards, or you mean actually really believing in sparkly yeah. vampires? Oh, I would say probably. I would say my werewolf fantasies have gotten a lot sexier. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to point out, in folklore, werewolves actually do become uh, vampires after they die. Werewolves do. Yep. I did not know that. Yep. Werewolves become vampires after they die. At least in some thought, and and some like uh, yeah, some of the words some. for okay. for vampire actually originally meant. Uh, like cool. I've learned something. Question. We were talk you talked a minute ago about the pop culturization of um, ancient legends turning into what our current, like this Bram Stoker taking the vampire and turning him into this. Do you find it frustrating trying to research the old legends or do you find it fascinating in that watching them get changed by different attitudes? Well, yeah. you want to start? Yeah. Uh, I was well. I was just gonna say, going back to Old Norse, which I'm interested in. That's an interesting sort of intersection that that it is folklore, mythology, but it's also literature. Um, you know, in, intentional in writing to write a good story. So there's been a, a mix of the the literary uh, and, and uh, so sort of pop culture and uh, real folklore for a while. So I'm okay with that. <laughs> well, I, I personally find it quite interesting. I think the uh, my, one of my hobbies is etymology, and, and word usage, word definitions change over time, and pretty much everything about us changes over time, with the exception of our core focus on humanity, as Joe was saying. Uh, but I, it doesn't bother me to see things metamorph and you know change over time. Uh, 
and those influences of pop culture happen so dynamically now in this age with you know modern technology that we have. Uh, so it's really difficult to predict how it's going to impact things in the long run. Um, but it doesn't bother me. It just it makes it a lot harder to get down to what the case zero is in a lot of cases uh, for modern things, uh, just because there's sort of this echo chamber on the internet. But uh, if you're researching older stuff. Thankfully, paper tends to stay kind of static, so that's good. You can watch these entities um, uh, morph and, ev and evolve uh, right before your eyes. Uh, is everybody familiar with Mothman? Uh, mm -hmm. Mothman originally was seen by a handful of people, including a woman named Linda Scarberry. And uh, I did extensive research there, including some updating with uh, Monster Quest. But, but I've spent quality time there, and I'm, I'm convinced that what Linda and others saw was a barred owl, which looks exactly it has the large red eyes and the and the winged uh, uh, configuration. It's only the size that's at issue in the early in the early descriptions. She could be describing a barred owl, and it is the place is a wildlife sanctuary filled with barred owls. So I, I almost rest my case right there. Uh, except they just saw it as bigger, and that's partly the, I think the fear factor, and just at night not realizing the distance and misjudging the height. But over time, Mothman began to change, began to look more extraterrestrial, had the wraparound eyes. There's a, st a statue now of Mothman, and Mothman now has arms and wings. Well, this does not occur in nature. There, you either have arms or you have wings as a, as a creature. You don't have both. But And I'll leave with just this one irony for me. Linda Scarberry clearly described in the early descriptions, we have a written account, of that she didn't see any arms on Mothman. And yet she herself, years later, uh, described the, the, how those muscular arms. She too had been influenced by the comic book versions and all the other stuff that had happened. And so you've got creatures that are morphing right in our own Time we could watch. So of course this is happening all through culture and all through history. Uh, these creatures are morphing, and I think that's that's fascinating to watch and to understand. And and also you, the point about wings and arms, dragons, wings and arms, not real. <laughs> well, I just finished. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you put that in, Blake. <laughs> uh, I was waiting to because it, I've been, been concerned Bale, about that. that. I wanted that's to bring it back. True. <laughs> I, I'm going to differ with Blake in that I do find it annoying. Uh, frankly, because um, be, because having as someone who has researched the historical background of zombies and vampires and these sorts of things, it's interesting enough as it is on its own merits. You don't need to. I mean, if you love Anne Rice and Stephen King, that, Stephen, I, great. I, that's all well and good. But don't pretend that that is part of the historical fact, of the background of this. Uh, I mean, I've talked to people who are very much into the, the vampire uh, subculture, and I've talked, and they're like, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I do these different things and these rituals and these incantations and these these blood things, and it's all part of you know, historical background. I'm like, yeah. what the hell are you talking about? The the, the, the historical background of, of of Dracula? You're 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 tracing this 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 ritual that you you are actually doing in real life to a fictional character. I mean, just just so you understand. So I mean, if they if, if they want to have their own fantasy world and they're play acting, that's fine. I'm not gonna whatever you want. But don't pretend yeah, yeah, that yeah. there is historical authenticity Bing behind it. gets very upset about this stuff with vampires because he's a stakeholder. Well, I, I, I kind of feel that way about certain things, too. Like, Hey, <laughs> look at yeah. the hour. These puns are free. But yeah. at the same time, I've and heard they're worth that every cent. <laughs> <laughs> You'll pay. <laughs> I think we have another yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, uh, Ben, you mentioned when categorizing vampires, and something I heard interested me. You said... Something about there's a certain kind of vampire that that goes after fat. Yes. Well, yeah. then I, you know there's something we can get to the media right away and really get some traction with because if we can start starting a an idea that there's a fat sucking way to lose weight that you really are going to get some traction. Anyway, it was just the, about, so. The, what's the, the fat yeah, sucking? Yeah, there's a caveat. I do discuss it a little bit in in, uh, in tracking chupacabra, but. I, I investigated a this this particular va fat stealing vampire. It's primarily uh, in Latin America and in uh, in the Andean mountains of yeah, South America, yes. and it's called the Liki Chiri. It's in the, it's in the book. Yeah, it's in the it's in the okay. book. Um, and uh, I when I was down, the, I was actually in La Paz, Bolivia at the time. I, I investigated this and I interviewed an ethnologist in La Paz, and I asked him about this because I heard about this this vampire, 
Y dice, ¿dónde está el chubby chaser? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how. That got me in so much trouble, you can't believe it. Let me tell you, man. Suddenly I'm in prison, I'm waking up, there's some kid sucking my toes. It was really weird. I don't know. Um, that's a different story. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, the leaky cheering. Yeah. Basically, it's, uh, what you have to understand about, about the fat is that, um, is that in, the, in the Andy Mountain, in the Andes Mountains, uh, it's very cold. And so, for, for the people who, who live in that, in that region, fat is actually, that, that protects you from, from freezing. And so, in, in the same way, for most of us, we're like, hey, you, know, you can ask some of my fat. Hey, there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. Right? Huh? But, but in that culture, within that context, uh, the, the loss of fat is actually a very serious issue. Um, and there, and it, has, it has very strong implications, again, connections with, with vampires. And what people believe is that, is that the Likichiri, it attacks people at night, usually on the Altiplano, which is the, the, the highlands there. And sometimes within the cities, so there are stories that uh, if you're riding a bus late at night, like a public bus, uh, that someone will wake up the next morning and their fat will be stolen. A, it's actually sort of part of a larger tradition of the kidney theft. The, the organs, the organ statue of urban legends, I've written about that. And that it's sort of a variation of that. And the idea is that it takes your fat, and here's the interesting part is, it sells them to American corporations. <laughs> So, so the, the idea, and many people really believe this. This is not, this is not a joke. Many people in Latin America believe that there are these leaky cheery fat stealers that take the fat out of, out, of, uh, out of South Americans and sell them to pharmaceutical companies here in the States. Now, I don't imagine they're getting much for it. Frankly, they can have some of mine. Um, but that's, that's and it, it gets into, you know, anti-American sentiment. It's getting all sorts of things. So that's... Likichiri, and, and a related uh, vampire is the Saka Ojos, which means eye stealers. Uh, and people believe that, that uh, the, the eyes are actually taken usually from children and uh, implanted into foreigners, usually Americans or Europeans, uh, kids. So that's it's in the book. Um, no, I was just wondering, um, as you said regarding uh, Mothman, uh, somebody saw a barn hour and they conflated into something else, some kind of... Um, extraterrestrial or cryptid. Um, do you think we should teach people how to observe things and how to just uh, think things through? They see something kind of odd, kind of out of place, to just, rather than freak out, just try to assess the situation. Because often, I, um, a few weeks ago, the, uh, the, the courts in New Jersey, they, they, they placed um, um, certain emphasis, um, well, not emphasis, um, regarding they, they, they talk about eyewitness testimony. Yes, eyewitness testimony is because a lot of them are just not reliable. Right. Because you see something, you're, you mean you're in a crime, you see something, you're not really observing that. Should, should there be some type of uh, curriculum or something to teach people? Well, I wish, of course, I wish we could, uh, in the schools, I wish we could teach some just basic critical thinking points like who has the burden of proof and um, Occam's the principle of Occam's razor which is useful all the time but uh, these encounters like Mothman or, or a predecessor the Flatwoods monster also in West Virginia which I investigated and uh, people there are probably seeing a barn owl simply a nighttime creature uh, the description of the shape of the face the high-pitched hissing noise the the fierce claws is just a classic, perfect description of a barn owl. But people, people who see something are caught often off guard. They're not preparing to see it. They have a real encounter that is something, they saw something. And their perceptions, they're just not very good in the being excited and afraid of what they've seen and not understanding what it is. Uh, it, it's... Uh, it's very hard to deal with because they know what they think they saw. Just as you know, we people see a long-necked, multi-humped, undulating creature, and that's a sea serpent or a lake monster, 30, 40 feet long. What they may be seeing are otters, uh, three or four otters swimming in a line. It's very deceptive, and uh, it's very difficult to chase after people and convince them that what they saw, uh, they did really have a real experience, and. Uh, so we're not dealing with people who are hallucinating or who are drunk or who are liars. They have had a real encounter with some creature. Uh, and even when we can reasonably infer what that creature is, they don't want to hear it. 
to, to, per your question about should it be in schools, though, that that's a continuing issue for skeptics and skeptical activism. And lots of people in this community have tried to get uh, critical thinking courses added into the curriculum. Um, the James Randi Educational Foundation, I believe, is putting a lot more emphasis on that uh, as well. So you might want to look at that. And um, Sharon Hill, um, Sharon does, Sharon, Sharon's got a curriculum that she put together for her local school system. You could probably she's I doubt it on Twitter, uh, and, but there's there's a lot of resources that are have been produced and are available. But actually getting them injected into your school system is uh, kind of a challenge, and it's probably nothing that can be solved at the national level right now. The way school systems are set up. School book, exactly. It's like so I there did are materials out there, and if there are teachers in the audience, or you know teachers who want to c come talk to us, any of us can can sort of direct you in the right in the right place because yeah. there there is some material out there. There we need to be more, obviously, but there is you know I did this a is guys uh, education. I did a book for that express purpose called The Magic Detectives for for children, and it's been used in some cases in schools, and uh, teachers have used it. Uh, I've gotten. Of all my my books, I, I've gotten as good a feedback from the magic detectives as any, from parents and from children, including one child who wrote me, uh, sending me a little homemade book that she had made. Said, "I hope you like my book as much as I liked yours." <laughs> but the 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 idea of the magic detectives is I have real paranormal cases, about 30 in the book, filled with clues. They're they're not made up. Uh, they're they're real, actual cases of Bigfoot and the like, and it has clues. And the the child's encouraged to try to solve the case and then you can turn the book upside down and find out how the magic detectives really solved it and so it's a fun way to try to teach critical thinking but um, you know we've, we've not been able to get critical thinking in the schools uh, the, many times the local religious people will say well if you can question this where will it lead um, pretty soon you could be questioning God and they, they don't note. want critical thinking into the, in, in the schools. We, we've come to the end of our time, so I, I would just like to say vampires for critical thinking. I think uh, we, we know that. Uh, zombies for critical thinking. Yay, critical thinking. Thank you.